hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it was painful. Uh, it was really uh, killing your darlings, as they say. But uh, we did a dry run of the road trip. And for every person we filmed, we probably interviewed a half dozen others. Uh, when we got into the editing room, we felt we had this embarrassment of riches and we wanted to produce a four-part series out of all of the material we shot. That uh, never materialized, unfortunately. Uh, and so we had to choose from among the, the so many stories that we shot. And we tried to choose the stories that felt the most poignant, the ones that reflected the greatest diversity, and as you put, that, that showed the despair as well as some of the hope. Uh, and we're determined to make sure that those other stories live on, either as pieces on the news hour, on PBS, or certainly on the PBS website. Um, I refuse to let them die on the cutting room floor. And John, for you, from all those interviews, if you had to pick maybe two or three of the most powerful moments for you in the film where you were just like, I don't even know what to say next, what were those, what were those for you? Moments that didn't make the final film? Or no, moments that, that made did. it, that did make the final film. Oh, wow. Um, I, there were so many, you know. I, I wish I could have made a documentary about the crew's experience making this movie because every day, uh, this, this man, who's a sadist, <laughs> um, had us working very long hours. There was usually routinely 16-hour days with a lot of travel. Um, we, everyone was always so exhausted, and we would get up in the morning and be so drained. And then people would welcome us into their homes and open up so profoundly. When you're struggling, you don't want anyone in your life to know about it. You don't want your family or your neighbors or your coworkers or your friends to know the humiliation and uh, we got people to open up and tell us things that they wouldn't tell anyone. So it, it, the entire film was a series of just devastating and moving days every day. But um, Fior Vasquez really stayed with me. You saw her early in the film in, in Central Falls, Rhode Island, one of the first people we spoke with who was 30, a 32-year-old grandma who was taking a, a, a bus, minimum wage, uh, in a bankrupt town and trying to feed an entire family. Um, there were a lot of stories that didn't make the film, like the Cherokee Reservation in North Carolina that was an amazing story. Um, but, uh, I, you know, it, it, it was, it's hard to pick just one. There was a Colombian family of undocumented workers in Alabama in a trailer park that made me cry because the father was facing deportation. And it, it's not in the film, in the finished version. Um, but, uh, Honor Roll's kids, and the dad got pulled over at a DUI stop. He wasn't drinking, but they checked his papers, and they were deporting him. And, and I was missing my little baby at home, and I couldn't believe it. And I, I said, well, what are you going to do? If they deport you and send you away, and your family's back here, what are you going to do? And he looked at me like I was an idiot, and then just said, um, his wife tra was translating, he just said, I'm going to hire another coyote and cross the border again. <laughs> and, and to me, that spoke to the resiliency of just about everyone we met. Mm. So across the film, you meet people who are d disenchanted with the American dream. Um, and that can either lead to increased activism. We saw Fight for 15. We saw Moral Mondays. Or it can lead to apathy. And it can lead to sort of despair with government. Um, what were sort of some of your insights uh, around, that and, uh, around that phenomenon and the way in which that disenchantment had manifested itself for people? And there, what was the difference between the people who had decided they were fed up and they were going to go uh, you know, do activism versus those who had just kind of given up? Uh, there was such a range of reactions to people's struggles. Some were angry at the government, frustrated with their plight. Um, some were hopeful in spite of the odds that they faced to ever advance and pull their families out of poverty. Uh, and some, as you said, um, decided that the path they wanted to take was through activism. And I think some people, uh, I'll take just uh, one example. We had two fast food workers. We had Fior Vasquez and we had Tina McCoy. Fior was the woman. Uh, in Rhode Island, um, 
sadly, she and her boyfriend were so damaged from the abuse that they had suffered uh, and their situation seemed so hopeless to them that they really didn't see any pathway out. Uh, Fjord's really um, poignant words that, that really stuck with me was, um, uh, the American dream is just a dream. And John asks, well, was it ever real? And, and she responds, well, yeah, for the people that had the connections and the wherewithal, but not for those of us starting from the bottom. Uh, so I think folks like that um, are, are so disabled by the trauma that they've been through that they can't embrace the activism. Someone like Tina McCoy can and, and, and is and was an instrumental part of the Fight for 15 in Atlanta. And I think it's a combination of, of background and personality and resiliency. And some people just have that resiliency gene and, and some don't. One of the quotes actually that most struck me in the film was um, when they said, I don't know anybody who's made it. Um, it wasn't just about the own personal limitations and economic mobility. It was the sense that no one around me has been able to sort of escape this, um, this poverty. And so what did you notice about socioeconomic segregation? Um, you know, when you were interviewing all these folks. I mean, there was obviously some um, low-income people who were um, operating in a more wealthy or high-end neighborhood, and there were those who were really isolated in pockets of poverty. And what did you, what were your takeaways from the film in terms of how place matters and how zip code matters and how socioeconomic uh, segregation matters? Well, you know, <laughs> academics always ask, uh, how is it possible in a country with this much opportunity that so many people live their lives within 50 miles of where they were born and they go into the same field or, or worse than their parents and they don't climb the ladder. Mm -hmm. It's been that way for a while. And, and there's a term for this, social reproduction, um, where there's just the next generation's a Xerox. It doesn't move anywhere. In, in making this film, it's easy to see how a community, a neighborhood, can be depressed in the same way an individual can be when there's an absence of hope, when despair is the only ethical reality to cling to, um, and when hope is a cruel joke, uh, it's something that people of privilege who've never been to your town say on a TV. Um, I was surprised we didn't find more bitterness. We found lots of people who were racked with fear. We had one couple in Ohio, a Caucasian couple in their 60s, who were going on, on Snap for the first time and like a lot of white folks in the middle class, couldn't believe it was happening to them. And um, there was a lot of experts we talked to in the film that didn't make the final cut. You see a few academics and the mayor of, of uh, Detroit, but everyone from uh, Paul Krugman to Mike Huckabee to Alan Grayson to Barbara Ehrenreich uh, sat down to, to Niall Ferguson at Harvard, who, who wants to blame income inequality on teachers' unions having too much power. Um, you know, it was also a great parrying of ideas, and, and again, the great challenge Roger and his team faced was, was cutting it down. It, it's easy to see how communities fester and how things get worse, and it crosses racial boundaries. Um, it's by design. It's preventable. Government policies got us into this. Government policies could get us out of it. We know what Eisenhower did worked. We know Clinton did a couple things that, that could work again, um, but we choose not to. And so uh, it's by design. And I, I have a line that I say um, in my stand-up act sometime that it's never been conservative versus liberal. It's always been aristocracy versus democracy, and uh, which is preachy and hard to say. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, but again, we never stopped running out of people who had hardships that most of us in this room could never imagine, and they weren't despondent. They were just getting out of bed every day and doing what they got to do and trying to make it better. Mm -hmm. and I thought the film was so interesting in light of some data that was released, um, or a study that was published yesterday by Raj Chetty and his colleagues, showing how um, if you're wealthy, you know, your lifespan isn't very much affected by place, but if you're poor, depending on where you live, there's going to be dramatic variation. And I thought, 
your film sort of prematurely almost spoke to that by looking at the obesity question, you know, looking at food deserts, looking at environmental racism and public health crises. I mean, the data is there. We have it on economic mobility. There's hard data, but I was very struck by how the stories in this film, even before we knew this research was coming out, um, just illustrated It's, it's crazy for me since we've done it. I mean, the survey that came out last fall about how uh, uh, Caucasians and Gen, Gen X Caucasians uh, between their late 30s and early 50s are the the group whose lifespan has decreased the most, and it's due in large part to alcohol and drug abuse and suicide. And the people that I, I went to school with. And um, likewise, we found out today that General Motors is opening a new Cadillac plant, but not in Detroit, in Kansas, where it's a lot cheaper. Uh, it almost seems like every day since we've made the film, there are new studies that, that come out that reflect on it. And one of the funny things about this movie is, at the time we talked to the racist, the white supremacist dude in Atlanta, Jared Taylor, um, I, I remember saying to Roger, what, what does this guy have to do with the American dream? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we, ta why are we putting a racist and white supremacist movement into a film about the American dream? Well, there's a certain presidential campaign that's been going on for the past couple of months, and it actually shows how a lot of... Um, folks struggling to stay in the middle have been told by the top to blame the bottom. And I was really surprised two months ago to find out when the first racist Donald Trump robocalls began, uh, talking about the threat to white Americans and how he will help white Americans, the person doing the robocalls was the one and only Jared Taylor from our movie. Really? Yeah, so he actually became involved with promoting the Trump campaign. Fascinating. Just but Trump, Trump is another guy. He, he's speaking to the issues. It's just... He's, 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 he, he's, <laughs> he is speaking to the frustration that millions of Americans who worked really hard and don't know what happened to the American dream uh, are, are furious over. And he's certainly the wrong spokesperson, but I think we've seen with both his campaign and Senator Sanders, uh, there's a large amount of Americans who don't feel their concerns have been addressed. And if the good people don't reach them first, the other ones will. You're hitting on a question I was about to ask, um, which is, uh, you know, that we have a big election coming up. Um, you know, we're in Washington blocks away from where policymakers are making decisions every day whether or not to cut funding for food stamps or whether or not to um, invest in high poverty neighborhoods. There are so many themes that were explored in this film, and ideally all 535 members of Congress would watch it. But if you had a minute, a minute with, uh, with each member of Congress, what would you urge them to take away from this film? I think they all believe, as John said in uh, his stand-up, uh, that the word working poor should be an oxymoron. You should not be working full time and have a family living under the federal poverty line. And so if they, in fact, share that conviction, um, what I'd want to do is hold their feet to the fire and point out that there are many social safety net programs that enable those folks who are working full time and living in poverty to survive. Uh, and cutting those programs uh, will decrease the mobility of those folks. Um, one of the people we interviewed, John mentioned, was Paul Krugman. He basically said that the Europeans have this much more developed social safety net, which enables them to live the American dream while we can't in this country. One of, the, yeah, one of the things that's actually very striking to me is that a lot of people think of the safety net as just mitigating hardship, when in reality a lot of research has shown that the investments you make in the safety net both mitigate hardship but also foster long-term economic mobility, employment outcomes, educational outcomes, health outcomes. It's about family economic security now as well as mobility in the long term, and mm -hmm. I think it gets lost a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, if I had a minute with members of Congress, I would remind them what Eisenhower did and how the 1950s, which they claimed to believe was the good old days, was uh, a time when capitalism and socialism worked really well hand in hand. Uh, it wasn't great for everybody, but generally that's when we think of the middle class as thriving um, through you know, great gains in capitalism, but also a strong safety net, infrastructure programs like the, the interstate highway bill, socialism like the GI bill, and progressive taxation that's nothing like what we have now, 
we know that when Eisenhower did it, it worked. He was the last Republican president to balance a budget and have a surplus. We know what works. We just don't want to do what works. So I would then remind them, Matthew 25, where Jesus says, if you want to follow me, <laughs> you take care of the poor, you take care of the sick, you're kind to those in prison. He gives those instructions to individuals and nations. And then um, I would say uh, the best thing for capitalism is a living wage workforce that can afford to buy shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and, and one thing that your film has on President Eisenhower is that uh, you guys take a gender and a racial equity lens across the film. Um, you, know, yes. the you know, the 1950s... Were not a great decade for everyone, as not I a great, mentioned. As you said, yes. not a great decade for everybody, but I think that your film actually, you know, takes care in both the statistics that you portray as well as in interviewing a wide range of people to make sure that issues of gender and race are sort of implicitly integrated across the film. You know, and today is Equal Pay Day. It's the day that women would have to work to make the same wages as men made for the whole past year. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that uh, that's for, you know, the average woman, whereas African Americans, Latinas, Native American women, et cetera, all have uh, larger pay gaps on average. Um, and so when you were crafting this film and pulling the script together, what were the influences informing um, the gender and racial dynamics that you brought to bear on how it was brought together? That's a good question. I guess um, I'm accustomed working uh, mainly for PBS for decades to trying to be as inclusive and to reflect as much diversity as possible. You know, we're governed in the editing room by choosing the most powerful stories regardless of the race or ethnicity of the person we're profiling, um, but we're always conscious of the need uh, for these films to reflect the diversity that's, that's out there. And to speak to your point earlier um, about being so much more segregated now across class lines, um, that's something that was so striking in making this film. Uh, and um, Robert Putnam, who we interviewed, has written books about this, but um, he's documented the extent to which that sort of segregation across class lines leads to diminished mobility, and those parts of the country where uh, there is more segregation across class lines experience far uh, far less mobility. They have less what he calls social capital. There's less civic engagement and, and that exacerbates this problem of social mobility. Yeah, and I mean, just for equal payday, one statistic that always strikes me, um, CAP commissioned this when we did the Shriver Report a few years ago, is if you were to close the gender wage gap, you'd cut poverty for working women and their families in half. Um, you know, so these fair pay issues and these issues of w w wages. But then you just build up their dependency on a living wage. Come on. Oh, God, I forgot. Then well, they're dependent on food and shelter and medicine, too. I know. Well, you can only pick two. Mm -hmm, yeah. Exactly. So, um, and if you were to raise the minimum wage to $12 an hour, you'd save $53 billion in food stamps. So there you have it. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought the point about the taxpayer um, really footing the bill for corporate um, sort of... This, That's this the whole Walmart argument. I, mm -hmm. I wrote that as a, as a monologue for current TV. Price is so nice, you pay for them twice. Because <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're paying for the low price now, and then when you're paying for the uh, health care or the um, SNAP benefits of the underpaid employee, you're picking up the corporation slack again. And, um, you know, if, if that's a company that takes uh, the billions in, in federal tax dollars and subsidies that Walmart has taken, uh, a little pay raise to $10 an hour is nice. It's the tip of the iceberg in terms of, in terms of equality, especially when you consider uh, how many American companies they put out of business, mom and pop companies, and that they pretty much outsource their manufacturing to China. So again, it, it's a question of what does patriotism mean? You know, is it our is it pride in our ability to blow up third world nations of brown people? Is it is it slogans? Is it shitty country songs? Or is patriotism looking out for the people and the land and air and water uh, that really make up America? And, and I think that that's an argument that the right person could uh, could reach our conservative brothers and sisters with. Well, before I turn over to audience questions, I'm going to ask you each um, one last question and then start thinking of your questions, and we'll have some time for audience Q&A. 
Um, my last question is, what's your charge to the audience? Um, you know, you've, they've now seen this film. Again, we are in Washington, D.C. Um, you have this big election coming up. Uh, you can't tell people who to vote for. This is a 501c3 event. But uh, if you were to give a charge to uh, the audience based on this film, uh, what would it be? I think as filmmakers, what we try to do by putting the human face on these issues is to try to foster empathy. And empathy is the beginning of, of, of action. And so I think by uh, encountering people that our general audience may not meet and, and see every day, by understanding their struggles and their aspirations, uh, that that can foster a receptivity and support for the kind of programs that I think are necessary to restore the American dream. I, John said it, and, and I think this film is predicated on the notion that, um, yes, there are forces that have damaged the American dream, like deindustrialization and globalization and automation, but there are also concrete policies that have done this damage. And if these policies exacerbated the problem, then I believe fervently that there's a lot of policy that can go a long way towards restoring the American dream. So that's a long-winded way of saying that start with empathy and then mm -hmm. move to policy. Yeah, NAFTA's a lot creepier than NAMBLA, and that's saying a lot. I, I guess I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I would say to people, if you saw any of, if any of this film resonated with you, if any of the stories in it touched you or reminded you of a time in your life or someone you knew, um, try to try to vote for the person who's going to do the most to uh, help the most people, and and um, and try to vote for the person who's going to threaten the people who own this country the most. All right, so uh, turning it over to you all for audience Q&A. Yes, right there. Thank you. You had uh, shots in the film from 20 years ago, was it? The, or yes. Which is a long time. And I'm really curious what the previous documentary was and whether you saw any stories from that that might actually have been positive instead of the ones that just showed the repeated mistakes or m repeated problems? So the film that uh, was shot 20 years ago was called Ending Welfare as We Know It. It was shot uh, when uh, President Clinton signed that landmark legislation into law and people were hitting their lifetime limit of welfare assistance. And we thought it would be amazing to go back and see what happened to the next generation of those families since mobility is best measured across generations. Uh, and uh, we saw that uh, in some respects, the Sledge family uh, remarkably um, was doing much better than they were doing 20 years ago, but they still had such challenges. They had a, you know, a teenage mom in the family, a, a son in prison, and yet their outlook uh, was so much brighter and they were so much more uh, hopeful. Um, and Rebecca Phillips uh, wasn't in as dire shape as she was uh, when we met her 20 years ago, but her kids are trapped in the same kind of low-wage, dead-end jobs that she's been trapped her entire life. Um, and we actually um, revisited at least a half a dozen other people from earlier films because we like this formula of is the next generation advancing uh, given that we documented what the parents were going through a long time ago. And I would just add that unfortunately um, there's efforts to repeat the same movie, not your movie, but the TANF movie. Um, you know, right now there's efforts to consolidate and block grant several of the programs that people turn to in this film, whether it's SNAP or Medicaid, um, et cetera, and to send them to the states that would cut, you know, millions of people off of basic social assistance. And so we, we've seen this movie before, and in addition to protecting that system of social assistance, it's really important that we build and strengthen it as evidenced by the film. Yes. Okay, so I work in um, international development for uh, livelihoods for the poorest in Africa. 
And we have in this town two multilateral banks and USAID, and we do economic development uh, for countries. We program money, we have objectives. And um, just Vietnam um, brought its poverty rate down from 70% to 30% in 15 years. And so like, then the question is, well, what's different? And it's like, may well, maybe v Vietnam wants to eradicate poverty. And so it has the, p the planning. And then um, I'm also from or originally from Oregon, and they did a, a planning process of where do we want to be in 2010, where do we want to be in 2025, internally as a community. So cities can do this, states can do this, and economics was a great, uh, you know, a huge part of that, along with quality of life and along with lifelong um, learning and human resource development. Thank you for your comment. Um, is there another question? Uh, yes, the lady in the back. You, yes, the one who's turning around. <laughs> Well, the question that I have, um, it has to do, well, it's two prong. One is that I want to know why did you use roadside uh, folk music instead of probably searing, sad, um, melodic sound effects? And the other question is, um, I felt like when you covered African Americans, you, um, you use cliche narratives. But someone like me, I'm Gen X, and my family is from the backwoods of South Carolina. And then they moved to the sawmill. I'm the first one to go to college out of all my family. And I have um, extreme debt. I live here in DC. These stories are never told. But the ones about someone who works at a fast food restaurant is the face of black America. A lot of black Americans, we look pretty middle class in our clothing and our speech, but we're starving. Um, why don't you have more people like me who are just a bit more diverse and complex? Well, in, in fairness, uh, you know, if you were tallying up the, uh, the racial makeup of the film, I think you'd find uh, as many stories of poor white people struggling. You had the story of, of, of Rebecca Phillips uh, who uh, had been a fast food worker and now works at a call center for, for 12 bucks an hour. We also had uh, one of our stories about student loan debt that uh, unfortunately, because of the time constraints we were under, didn't make it into the film. Um, but uh, I, I think that that looking objectively across the, the film, there's, there's a, you know, a, a quite a, uh, uh, a range of diversity, and there's there's there are poor folks, and then there are middle class folks that we set out to to profile as well. In terms of the music, um, there was some really sad music, but this this was a road trip, and so there was some uh, of the exuberance of of being on the road. We had a political comedian as the host, and it needed that that sort of uplift, that that irony, that levity. So. That was what informed the choice of the music score. I'm, I'm sorry that you, you felt that the inclusion of the fast food workers was a cliche. I respect your argument. Um, to me, uh, I didn't do the casting of the film, but I appreciated having them there because I thought that what Roger was doing was putting a human face and a human story behind the folks a lot of Americans take for granted, the ones who service our food. Uh, and yeah, their story is documented. Um, and, and Roger tried to document as many different types of American stories from as many different types of cultural backgrounds as possible in the film. Uh, I, I do hope that there are people who will see the movie and with the two women in the film who, who work in the fast food industry that they will walk away with a deeper appreciation for the struggles of, uh, of those folks who serve them their food and are so often disregarded. You can sure go ahead. You can holler. In terms of the progressive agenda that would be needed at a federal and state level to implement policies that would 
remedy so many of these well communicated problems. How do you realistically see uh, progressive minded people who might be inspired by your film overcoming such hurdles as Citizens United, voter suppression, uh, touchscreen machines that don't work. Those and things hurt conservative people too. And, right, and, and, and of course gerrymandering in the House that keeps the House so conservative. How could a progressive coalition inspired by your work and others seeking progressive goals reach those goals? Not limiting it to progressives. The other thing I, I would say is that uh, we're engaged in this pretty ambitious outreach initiative and we've conducted over 200 community screening events wow. and the goals of these events are to give these organizations the film to use as ammunition to advance their goals and objectives uh, and we're going to continue uh, to do those and to that end uh, what I want to say is that if anyone here is affiliated with an organization that is inclined to use this film with your constituents, with your members, I'm gonna actually ask you to see Melissa and I'm gonna give her some of my cards. Just e email us and we'll facilitate uh, these kind of screenings. We've got screening toolkits and viewer guides and action steps and resources and all this stuff is eventually gonna live on the PBS website so we're, we're, we're trying to do those things. The other thing I would also just note is that I know it's easy to get pessimistic with so much gridlock in Congress, but even if you just look at the past two weeks, you've seen $15 minimum wage in New York and California, expanded pay leave in California. You're seeing state legislatures consider expanded pre-K. There's a lot of bad news, but there's also a lot of momentum with home care workers organizing, fast food workers going on strike for $15 an hour. And th that local change is building momentum, I think, for a uh, national movement and national change. And there's reasons for optimism. Um, and it's, it's because, in part, the people who are directly affected are turning out in the streets and saying, I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore. Yes. No. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. I have a question for you, John. Um, thanks for the wonderful film and your role in it. I thought you asked some pertinent, very pertinent questions and, um, and made some very pertinent statements. Um, I'm, I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter and I'm also uh, from Europe, Germany in particular. And what, I'm, I'm also a US citizen now, but what, what still strikes me, I mean, every day is America's uh, aversion against anything that has anything to do with government, government services, uh, y you know, in anything, uh, government uh, finance, education, health. Uh, coming from Germany, I have benefited from all these wonderful things. I mean, German government paid for my education, basically. I come from a, a family that I, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my, in my mouth. So I, you know, Germany financed all of that. Shh, Americans might hear what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. We're 3,000 miles away from all that for a reason, okay? <laughs> People don't I need to know. I want to, but my question is to you, how do you explain this aversion against anything that has anything to do with government? Has it anything maybe to do with racism? Because I, I, I there are a lot of I, I think it's African American uh, employees in government. I, 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 I just appeal to people's selfishness. Uh, I'll, I'll say, doesn't America deserve to have the greatest health care and public school system in the world? What, doesn't America deserve a health care system like Israel has? You know, doesn't America deserve to have paid family leave like France has? You know, and, and uh, why do those people get more for their tax dollars than us? A and, and usually that sort of logic, appealing to someone's selfishness, will, uh, will, will wake people up more than appealing to their better nature. I mean, I think also that some of the research suggests that people divide poor people into us and them, into deserving and non-deserving, when in reality, four and five Americans at some point during their working years is going to experience at least a year of significant economic hardship, whether that's poverty or unemployment or turning to the safety net. And when you start to think about poverty not as a identity but as an experience, you realize that this social insurance system is there for all of us, not just some stagnant class. So I think it's, that's an important point you raised. Thank you. Do we have you. time for how many more questions? One more, okay. Um, the uh, gentleman in the center there. 
the, the one most difficult to get a mic to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving Billy a run for it. So the PBS broadcast is October 12th. Uh, it's uh, going to be branded as an election special by PBS. Uh, and be a, s a longer version of the film, right? No, actually oh. it's going to be a slightly shorter one. We've learned oh. 90 <laughs> minutes. Uh, uh, this was about 99. So the, the PBS version will be 90 minutes. Uh, and there will be two and a half hours of additional stories living on the PBS website if they don't find a broadcast home. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Thank you um, so I'm much. I know that um, John and Roger have to catch a flight, um, but I will be here if anyone wants to talk afterwards for a few minutes and get those cards. So thank, thank you all you. again for coming.